Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Bait Tehillah Heal Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and I'm here in Studio B with Pastor Nick Plummer. Hey, Pastor Nick. Shalom. Yep, we got a treat for you. Yeah, we do. We got a treat for you this week. We are in Hanukkah season right now. It is the second day of Hanukkah. We're headed into the third night of Hanukkah as we're recording this video. And what we've done so far is we've done a couple teachings. The first one was... Uh, we did a part one and a part two of should Christians celebrate Hanukkah. Yeah. That was the historical significance right. of Hanukkah and the prophetic significance of Hanukkah. And since we're still in Hanukkah and we're not back into the Matthew studies yet. That's right. Right. We had a great little party last night uh, here at, at the, the fellowship. And we want to get into Haggai a little bit. The book of Haggai, he's a prophet. This is after the Babylonian captivity that he is speaking to uh, the people trying to stir up some some favor. Right for the building of God's house. The Persians. That's right. And if you know, the whole season of Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedication. The dedication of what? The temple. That's right. And so we're going to get into this and dig in and have a good time. Yeah, basically what we want to do is we want to tie in, you know, who entered Antiochus's heart to defile the temple mount on the date that he chose. Correct. So we're going to be talking about dates in the past, in the present, and in the future. Yep. And... uh the focus is really the Temple Mount as far as like subject matter or a theme is going to be the Temple Mount. So here we have the book of Haggai. Haggai is the first of the prophets who spoke to the exiles after they had returned, of course, back to the land of Israel. Because of the precise dates given for each prophetic message, the events of this book may be dated more accurately than perhaps any other book in the whole Bible. Darius, of course, who was mentioned for the first two dates, was the Babylonian king that removed the interdict for the rebuilding of the temple in 521 B.C. Haggai ministered in 520 B.C. between the months of August and December. Check that out. He delivered four messages during this time. Okay. And uh, some would, of course, divide into two messages. But from the comments in verse 3 of chapter 2, it seems likely that Haggai was born before Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. Possibility. He was, therefore, a very old man at the time he prophesied, and his death may account for the brevity of his ministry. His ministry had a single focus, urging God's people to be obedient, especially in the rebuilding of the temple. The exiles had returned under Zerubbabel in 536 B.C., but opposition from the surrounding rulers, of course, and self-centered thinking, kept um, actually kept the returned exiles from doing any more than laying the foundation for the temple. Haggai and Zechariah were raised up by God to promote a spirit of revival among his people. Once again, some of these resources is found in, Ec in Ezra, in, in the book of Ezra. You can, this is a contemporary of that time period. Haggai's first message was one of challenge, but the rest was concerned with encouraging the people and their leaders in the work and reminding them of the consequences of previous disobedience. Following Haggai's ministry, work on the temple was begun again and completed, says here in 516 B.C. It is not known whether Haggai lived to see its completion. Interesting. So that's a little introduction that you found, what, in your Bible? Yeah, it's uh, the Hebrew, Greek, it's actually the, uh, let's see here. The Hebrew Greek Keyword Study Bible. Highly recommend this Bible. It's a Hebrew Greek Keyword Study Bible. It's got a built in concordance. It's got excellent cross references, a little commentary at the bottom. You brought some like Christian power tools to, to the podcast today. You got your Keyword Study Bible. Is this your ESV study Bible? That's the Life Application Bible. But it's the ESV? No, no, it's the King James. Okay, but Life Application Bible. I'm study not going to do ESV. Okay. And you've got your notes. My PowerPoint notes, yeah. Man. And I've got some great coffee. Yeah. It, like I said, Christian power tools. Man, you know, it's good. It is good. You know, if, if you want a job done right, you got to bring the right tools. 
it makes it so much easier to do this. Sometimes you can get the job done, but with the right tools, the job is just... Mm. So let's jump so into easy. the book of Haggai. Ryan is going to be reading. Do you have the King James or New King James? I have the New King James. Okay, New King James will be good. Let's check out uh, Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Uh, 1 through 5? 1 through 5. Got it. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple is to lie in ruins? Now therefore, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then he's, in 6, he does a little poem. Yeah, so basically we've got here, we have the Persian king, right, who's in power, granting them the request to go back down south, which right. is right there. The this is King Darius, Darius, right? Yep. And uh, we have, of course, the great prophet Haggai. Um, and then we have Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, governor of Judah. He's the governor, mm-hmm. this guy, uh, Zerubbabel. And then, of course, we have Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So you've got this Persian king that gives them, it's all about... Favor, um, gives them favor. Favor, but it's a, it's a chain of command. Yeah. So the leader lets them go and uh, has that uh, request granted to them, that favor. And then uh, you have, of course, uh, Hosea is the great prophet. Hosea, Haggai. And then Zerubbabel is the governor, and then... Uh, Jehoshadak. Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Uh, so basically, what we will look at is that the season of Teshiva begins on Elul 1 and goes to Tishri 10. And we know in, in, in Haggai 1 1, that's what we see in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. So Elul 1. Elul 1. First Teshuvah, day of the first day. Wow. Yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> if you know anything about Teshuvah, it's the season of repentance. It seems that he is calling the people to repent of their ways right. on Elul 1. Where the, the word of the Lord came. Yeah. So that's why we do teshuva. Right. See, we're going to be fulfilling the, the fall feast because, you know, we're going to be practicing it, rehearsing it, doing that's it. That's right. So let's continue on and let's go ahead and look at, um, I guess we'll do. Uh, Chapter one, verse six, right? Let's do, uh, let's go ahead and read verses six, six through eight. All right. So uh, after he says, consider your ways in verse five. He says this, it's a little like, almost like a poem. It says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but are, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Wow. So, of course, you know, in, in Haggai 1, six, you have sown much and bring in little. So they're having some poverty. The, the blessings aren't quite there. Well, God's they, they earn them. wages and they put it in a bag and it has holes. That's terrible. Yeah, it's not good. That's terrible. It reminds me of uh, what I say, Malachi 3.8, you know, where how do you rob God but don't bring your, your, your tithes to the, to the storehouse? Bring the whole time. I'm going to write this down here. I want to write this next to this verse. Ooh. I would call verse 8 a priority. Ah, yes. You know, like the Lord has asked us, Ryan, I want you to build a strong community and to raise the next generation. Yeah. I also want you to be a part of the restoration of the regathering whole house of Israel. Amen. I want you to extend a hand to the house of Judah. Amen. See, so so these are mandates. Check, check, check. These are mandates. Yep. This is what I want you to do. Mm-hmm. We don't deviate. We don't change it. That's exactly what we do. So verse eight is, of course, a priority. Let's go ahead and continue on. You want to read verses 9 through 11? Sure. It says, You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above will withhold uh, above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and the mountains on the grain, and the new wine and the oil. On whatever the ground brings forth of men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Okay, so verse 8 is a priority. Now, verse 11, we would call that circumstances. Oh, yeah, because you didn't have your priorities right. Right. 
So verse 11 is all about circumstances, right? Yeah. And so let's check out, let's check this out. So we can, we can, we can actually distinguish what's going on here in the story that the house of the Lord was a priority. Right. Okay. And as we share these truths, rem, rem, I want to remind everyone that the third temple is very important to the Lord. It's part of prophecy. There are a lot of things that are going on. And um, the question is, is it time to build it? Well, that's the thing. That's the people the thing. have said it's not time. <laughs> but like I said, there are a, a, a lot of evangelicals that would say they would love to see something go up on the Temple Mount because the Antichrist will sit in it. We're going to talk about that at the end. And also the, the fact that the Jews would be winners because they get to put something up on the Temple Mount that they've always wanted to do. And just remember that if they want to bring back the animal sacrifices, that's, that's their belief system. That's what they want to do. So don't be critical of the altar or the temple mount or those animal sacrifices because we know that Yeshua is ultimately our sacrifice as Christians. But, but we got to be careful that we don't speak down on the Jewish people or, or the altar or anything. And to that point, there is a curse on those that criticize the altar of God. That's interesting, you know. Um, we, we just need to grow up. Well, it, the know? bottom line is that it will be the holy temple because in order for the Antichrist to sit in it and defile it, it must first be the holy temple right, of God. Right, right. And, and that's just a, a, a basic fundamental understanding of what's going to end up on the Temple Mount. And then even then, the sacrifices that you mentioned, I mean, Ezekiel's pretty clear that there will be sacrifices on the Temple Mount even when Yeshua is reigning for a thousand years. And what does this mean? It means that they're at least for a memorial, right? If not, right. If not just part of the practice of bringing, you know, your peace offerings and things like that. But that, that there will be sacrifices, and then it's not like Yeshua's putting a stop to it. You know what I'm saying? He's not going, hey, I'm your right. sacrifice. Remember, Don't do that. Yeah. So let me read verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. So we go in verse 8. There's a priority. Right. The house of the Lord. Verse 11 are the circumstances involved. Because they didn't do it, there was a drought and all these things. Now, verse 12, there's a remnant of people, Ryan, called Beit Tehillah. Yeah. That's obedient. And so now we have so the priority obedience. is brought to their attention by a rebuke, right? And then circumstances are brought upon them as part of the rebuke. And now their response is to be obedient to the Which Lord. Which is good. It is. You're not so hard-hearted. Right. Don't, it's like, don't be stubborn. It's like confessing your faults, you know. <laughs> You know, let's uh, let's go ahead and read 13, 14, and 15, and that will be chapter 1, but we'll, we'll finish up with those three verses. Uh, then, Haggai, the Lord, uh, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So that's the Lord's message. That's cool. Verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Okay, so we kick off. So it off. does, construction does start on the yeah. sixth month. 24th so so day yeah, so of, we kick uh, off a little one for Teshuvah, the word of the Lord comes, right? Mm -hmm. Declaring something. And now we have a reference to Elul um, 24. That's what we have. So this is the week before, the, before uh, Rosh Hashanah. Or the week before yeah, we let me row. let me read this commentary. It's it's actually chapter one verses one through twelve in, in this keyword study Bible. Let me just read this commentary as we were finishing up chapter one and making good time. By the way, praise God. Haggai's first message is a stirring challenge to the people through their political and spiritual leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua. The people look to the decoration of their own houses while doing nothing for God's house. Haggai twice says, "Consider your ways." This literally means to put upon your heart and speaks of a firm resolve. By these words, God is informing them that their neglect of the temple has resulted in his judgment on them. <laughs> their self-centered efforts will not satisfy because God is not blessing. Their first priority should have been to glorify God, and this devotion should be evident in the life of believers today. Right? Right? We can see a concern around that. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Take care of God's business. He'll take care of your business. So Period. we're progressively moving forward. I love the, the title of this next chapter, chapter 2. God's glory will again fill the temple. Yeah, mine says the coming glory of God's house. So I'll go ahead and begin reading a little bit here. Yes. Uh, let's go ahead and read. Let's see. 
Let's go ahead and read. Let's see here. All right, one through three. Chapter two, verses one through three. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So this is interesting. Yeah. Because that's what you mentioned in the intro about how it's possible that Haggai had seen right. the, the Solomon's temple before it was destroyed. Yeah. So then now to see what they've built, he's probably and like, are you kidding? <laughs> and that's his comment. And so this, this, is, this yeah. is on Tishri 21, which is what, the last day of tabernacles? Last day of tabernacles. That's right. It is, yeah. See, so he has it written on the notes. Last right. day of tabernacles. So, so here we have, uh, we're in chapter 2, and uh, they're moving forward. So let me go ahead and read, let's see here. I mean, imagine seeing Solomon's temple, you know, because you know he decked that thing out. He was, he was, that's who he was. You know, he was all about it. Let's go ahead and read... Uh, Plated everything in let's gold. do let's do I'll, I'll read four five six and seven okay yeah so so yet now be strong O Zerubbabel saith the Lord and be strong O Joshua son of Josedek the high priest and be strong O you people of the land saith the Lord and work for I am with you saith the Lord of hosts according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt so my spirit remaineth among you fear ye not for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Verse 7, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Wow. So he's encouraging the people at this point, you know, be strong, build the house. And I will return to it. Uh, in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, here's the commentary. Quite possibly the problem at this time was similar to the situation in Ezra, chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Those who had seen the original size and splendor of Solomon's temple, okay, which Nebuchadnezzar destroyed in 586 B.C., could not help but see how much smaller and less ornate this temple would be, and seeing such grew discouraged. Mm. Wow. Now, let's see here. Now, these um, people just had limited resources. There, was, there were fewer in number, and yeah. thus there was less labor, and they didn't have Solomon's you know, money. Yeah, let's, right? let's finish up here. Let's, let's look at 8 and 9. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts, which is kind of cool. Uh, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. All right. So let's just stop right there. Now, now check out this commentary. This is very interesting. Uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. God throughout this passage is called the Lord of hosts, which literally means Lord of armies. Right. What a comforting name for the people of Israel who felt that they were a tiny, powerless province of Persia. God confirmed that his spirit was in their midst according to the original covenant at Mount Sinai by which they became God's people, Haggai 2.5. Doubtless that such shaking as is mentioned in this verse, may have occurred at that time in the Persian Empire, yet these words have a much greater significance. The eschatological meaning is manifested in that God will shake all nations, a reference to worldwide judgment. It's coming. So the interpretation of the phrase, the desire of all nations, is much disputed. Some versions translate the phrase, they will come with the wealth of all nations. This is supported by the construction of the sentence in Hebrew. The verb shall come is plural, and thus the word desire cannot refer to an individual person. This verse is best understood as a reference to the nations that will one day bring their offerings to God to be consecrated for a service. Come on. It's almost like a near and a far fulfillment something. People that coming out of the nations, the Gentiles, want to go up to Zion. I want to go up to Zion. <laughs> <laughs> they want to go up to, to Zion. I've been on the Temple Mount. So we've we've read, of course, all the way up to verse 10. Did we not or no? We are up to 9. We're, We're up, up to, to 9. Yeah, so go, ahead, go ahead and read verse 10. So on the 24th day of the ninth month, 
In the second year of, of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying. Okay, so, so this is actually Kislev 24, the day before Hanukkah. So this is 520 B.C. So now all of a sudden, the word of the Lord comes to, the, to Haggai the prophet. So this is Kislev 24, the day before Hanukkah. Haggai took place around 520 B.C. Antiochus IV Epiphanes will come later around 175 B.C. So we're talking a good almost 400 years later. Oh, yeah. You know, so so basically we're, we're at 24th of Kislev. Mm -hmm. Now, Hanukkah is celebrated on the 25th. So verse 11, thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask now the priests concerning the law. Verse 12, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, no. No. Verse 13, then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Right. Verse 14, we'll stop right there. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. So they're not in a good state of mind. In that reference, right. uh, verse 14, they're unclean, and he's calling them out. Now, let's see here. Let's I mean, see. that's like all of us, you know. Are we, yeah, it's the Lord calling are out Are we coming? Right. And, and if this you're going to do something, have the right frame of mind. I right, mean, I think exactly that's... right. It's all about the heart issue, <coughs> right? Because people are so focused on what is the gift, right? Uh, but in a sense, they could have been bringing gifts that weren't great either, right? I mean, I think that there was some references to the gifts that they were bringing, not being um, like being blemished or, or whatever. That may not be in Haggai, but that's interesting. Let's go ahead and read. Uh, how about if you read uh, 15 through 19? Well, we can do like uh, 15 to, let's do, yeah, let's do 15 to 18. Yeah, that would be All nice right. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days, when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there was but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. So think about this, Ryan. Here's a principle. If, if, if we can just get this. I remember when Samuel jumped all over Saul and said, you've lost a kingdom. Right. God's going to give it to another person who has, you know, yeah. the heart of God. He didn't like that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> seeking after God's heart. Yeah. So, Ryan, I'll tell you, it's amazing to me the challenges that we can have in our relationships because you remember when Jesus had the Last Supper and he went down the Garden of Gethsemane, he said something very, very just good that we wish we could all have. I wish that you were one as I and the Father are one. Yep. He wanted that so badly. Yep. Now, the betrayer left the table. The guy left the table. So he wasn't a part of, of, of one. Yeah. Echad. So that's kind of where we're at. How can we be one? How can we agree to disagree? How can we get together and be one? So there was lack, and now he's saying, because you've done this, there'll be plenty. Right. So I believe even churches can go through a strife or a coup or a difficulty or circumstances, and, and God will withhold some blessings and some things for a season. But yet at the same time, he's like, you're going to get through this, and then you're really going to be blessed. So that's, that's my take on this particular uh, portion of Scripture because it's so important that if this whole thing was written between August and December, there you go. There's your two chapters. But once again, in verse 18, it's the day before Hanukkah. Right. So we need to make this a point. Okay. We need to make this a point. Um, well, and because the things of the temple and the rededication of the temple and the dedication of the temple, it's important to note that this is a special date. And so... 
you know, whether these things just happen to happen on these days or they chose this day specifically for this reason doesn't really matter. It's a right. significant day for us as Christians. I think so. Yeah, I mean, you know, even if you took out the uh, the, the the legend of the oil lasting for eight days, it was only a one-day supply, you still have a story. We still have Haggai. We still have the Book of Maccabees. And, we, and we're still in Josephus. I mean, we, Josephus. We, we're still going to have... Hanukkah's going to happen again. So see, God... He'll never judge until we get a sign. Yeah. Which, if you want to know more about that, go back and and uh, listen to the prophetic significance of Hanukkah. That's should Christians celebrate Hanukkah part two, uh, because you'll get some understanding from Matthew twenty four, right. cross referenced with uh, the book of Daniel, uh, chapter eleven, and also with uh, the book of, of First Maccabees, kind of just matching everything up and seeing how this is going to come to pass again. It happened, or the prophecy was given. It happened. Then Jesus says. It's going to happen again. You know, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I mean, the 24th of Kislev is going to be mentioned three times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's mentioned in verse 10, 18, and 20. Yep. So go ahead and read verses, um, just read verse 20. Okay, it says, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying. Wow. So let's jump into uh, 21 and 22. All right. It says, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of, de- of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. You know, just kind of going back to verses 10 through 19, uh, this third message of encouragement is based on holiness. Because remember, we're talking about uncleanness. Personal holiness comes only by conscious effort and sinfulness spreads and increases in one's life unless it is effectively combated. This was evident in the lives of the Israelites. Their sinfulness in certain areas had affected all of their activities. Haggai 2.14 However, since they had now repented and laid the foundation for the temple in obedience to the message Haggai had delivered previously, God asked if they were ready for a harvest because he was now going to bless their harvest. Haggai 2.19 um, in 2.18, he says, Consider now from this day and upward, which is the 24th of Kislev, this verse is Haggai's plea to the people to keep in mind the motives for their labor. Previously, the people of Israel were guilty of being slothful in their service. The result was God's punishment. The prophet calls them to renew their vigor in accomplishing the task that God had called them to, namely the rebuilding of the temple. In the midst of the believer's service for God, he or she should remember to perform every task, keeping in mind that God desires diligence and integrity. So we've got, we've got a lot of portions here of uh, scriptures that are very interesting. It says that I will, in verse 22, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. That's right. And the horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. Last verse, verse 23. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheetel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, he's, he likes Zerubbabel. Remember, he's the, uh, he's the governor, right? Yeah. He's the governor. Oh, uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, Verses 20 through 23 commentary. Completing the temple would not strengthen Zerubbabel's political power in the Persian Empire. So Haggai is given another message for this servant of God. As a descendant of David, he was in the kingly line of the coming Messiah. God had removed Jeconia from the throne, Jeremiah 22, 24, pronouncing a curse on him that none of his sons would ever again rule on the throne of David until the Messiah came. Wow. So... Let's look at the five-step process in Haggai. Five-step process found in Haggai. Number one, the priorities are not in place. Are your priorities in place? Wow. That's Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This took place on Elul 1 for Teshuva. Now think about it, Ryan. The word of the Lord came on the first day of Elul I, in the sixth month it's a big deal. Teshuva. Yeah. And here we are. We practice Teshuva. That's right. The season of Teshuva. Yeah. Number two, then now priorities priorities are in place. Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. This happens through Elul 24, Teshuva. So they had this time to think about it. 
Think about it, the first 21 days of Elul, we're doing the Daniel fast. And now here we have the priorities are in place, which is step number two. Step number three, the future temple. Haggai chapter two, verses one through nine. This takes place on uh, Tishri 21, which is the last day of tabernacles. So the future temple. Number four, the foundation of the temple is laid. Haggai chapter two, verse 18. Kislev 24. There it is. All right. The day before Hanukkah, Kislev 24. And last but not least, the fifth and final step or process, Judgment Day. Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Kislev 24, the day before Hanukkah. You could almost, instead of Judgment Day, you could almost call this redemption, right? Or, or vindication. Like God redeems the, the people of Israel by knocking their enemies off their backs, you know? Right. Um, you know, uh, when it talks about that he's getting rid of the horse and its rider, um, there's at least two other references uh, to that. I know the Song of Miriam, which is in Exodus. She talks about the horse and his riders thrown into the sea. Oh, wow. Pharaoh right. died, did he? Right. And I think there's even a reference that Pharaoh's daughter left with him or something like that. I never really pursued that. Not there's sure. a reference in the Psalms or something about Pharaoh's daughter was with them. I don't know. That's tough. Um, and then I know that in Jeremiah, it talks about when he's judging the Gentile nations, you know, the horse and its rider and its chariot and all that, you know. So he's referencing these things that the Israelites and the people of that day probably perceive as symbols of strength, chariots and horses. Um, oh, they got a lot of they got a lot of chariots and horses, you know, and they're going to come at us. And, you know, yeah. so those are the things that they're fearing. And he's saying, I mean, what's that song? I can handle some this. may trust in horses, some may trust in chariots. But I will trust in the name of the Lord. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So, Ryan, let's let's tie this in because we're looking at 520 B.C. We're skipping and going to go go over Antiochus in 165 B.C. because that all took place as well. Sure. He defiled this temple. Mm -hmm. Purposely, through Antiochus, Satan entered his heart to do all these things, these abominations. On the 25th of Kislev, the day after that it was rededicated. Right. He just jumped right in there and just defiled it. So let's check out the future. Uh, well, let's go ahead and look at this, uh, the defile of the temple. If you want to go ahead and follow. Yeah. Start right here and then take us, take us home. All right. So it says, The defilement of the temple by Antiochus took place on the 25th day of Kislev, the ninth month in the year 167 <laughs> B.C. The rededication of the temple by the Maccabees took place three years later to the day on the 25th of Kislev in the year 164 B.C. So see, dates are very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get a chance to read Jonathan Kahn's book. Mm, Return of the know, Gods. Yeah, and you look at the month of, of June, Ooh. a lot of things were passed by the Supreme Court that were not kosher. I was born in the month That were not June. good. You were born in June? I was born in June. Nehemiah, my second son, was born June 28th, and my brother was born June 27th. So anyway, um, these dates are important. That's why we want to stress the dates. Sure. So so if you go back to the 60s and you look at that June date, it's the season of summer, you know, uh, the Stonewall Inn episode that took place at this bar actually opened up a portal and began things to go into motion. But the reason why you can use that as a reference is because if you take that date, and I don't have it in front of me. Um, we'll be talking about this, I believe, this Shabbat a little bit. But if we take that date of the Stonewall Inn incident, it's public records, you can look it up. Um, the same date follows suit among the Supreme Court and their rulings. So it's kind of interesting how it all ties in. Yeah. So you've got these incredible dates. So, so now we're looking ahead to the future temple in the Antichrist, and what, what portion of Scripture are you going to so read? This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and this is talking about uh, a future temple that's coming. This is Paul speaking, and the Antichrist. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that day of Christ is at hand, or has already come. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, or a rebellion. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Interesting. So, so, so this is a sign. We know when this event happens, we'll know. That these so I guess the Apostle true. Paul had some things revealed to him. Right. So is the Temple Mount important? Let's close it out with the Temple Mount. You got to go on the Temple Mount. I've been share, several times now. Share your experience of going on the Temple Mount this year for Tabernacles. Well, so I wasn't on during Tabernacles. But I mean, you're... Yeah, I was there. It was um, after. It was before. Before Tabernacles. Before Tabernacles. Yeah. So I was there uh, before Tabernacles this year. Um, and, you know, every time I've been, uh, I kind of get the same feeling. There's a, a, a tension in that place. And more this time, I went with a big group one time, and then I went alone another time. I say alone, I went with my family. And the, when I went with the big group, we had the people from the walk, the, the Muslims, uh, watching us. They were filming us with their cameras and stuff. It was a very, very strange experience, you know. Um, but we had a big group. And, uh, and <laughs> anyways, it was, it was an always interesting experience to see people just upset by your presence, upset by the fact that you might, God forbid, pray. Um, it's, a, it's a weird situation. There's a spiritual battle for that place today. A physical, but more than the physical is the spiritual battle. There's a principality there that's squatting. There's a And squatter. the Temple Mount is a very special place. Absolutely. I was only on the Temple Mount one time back in the 90s. I'll tell you what I'd like to recommend is the, the Israel guys did a six-part series on the Temple Mount because there's a book out by this guy named Rob Cornuke that has made the idea that the city of David is actually the place of the yeah, former temple. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. More, was it called sensationalism? It is a sensationalism campaign, which, you know, God bless the guy. You know, it is what it is. Bottom line. Pick your is battles. That, is, what's really interesting is even some of the sources that he quotes are in the videos by the Israel guys saying, yeah, he's saying that I, uh-uh, that's not true. This is, what I, this is what I've said. This is what this is. This is what that is. And he's like, they're basically just shutting down the, the testimony, you know. Um, he's like, because like what he'll say is, oh, they're afraid to say this because you know, they'll get in trouble with the Israeli authorities or whatever. And then they come out and say, like, I can say whatever I want. I am the Israeli authority. <laughs> right. These are archaeologists and right. things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, the scholars. really, really good, uh, well done, point by point. They take, you know, hey, this is what's been said, this is what's been said, and they take each video and they kind of break it down for you and show you why the Temple Mount is where we presently believe it to be. And the the new archaeological evidence showing like it was actually where the dome of the rock is like that's where the temple sat that spot and um and that someday the temple will sit in that spot again according to what we're reading i mean we're reading something the prophecies what did, here. what did yeshua say he wanted a house of prayer for all nations for all nations well that, that's what isaiah said well i guess there's a there's a consensus among the jewish people that the gentiles can go up there if they build something they're going to allow them so it's interesting i went to this place called first station which is uh, an old train station in Jerusalem. And it's now set up as like a little main street. There's lots of shops and restaurants, very trendy area, lots of like art and shop. And a cool, cool place. And in the ceiling, right, there's this like canopy and somebody's done like an art installation with paintings. And it says a house, of, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations is the quote. But then it shows like a Muslim and a Hindu and a Buddhist and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 no. When you read the verses, it's very, very clear right? The people that are going to get to go to the house of prayer for all nations are those that keep the Sabbath, keep the commandments of God, and have called Yahweh their God, yeah. and then they become his people. Right. And so it, it's, it's very clear who goes. It's all nations, but it's those from the nations that are, are, are considered righteous because they have aligned themselves with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and with his son, Yeshua. So in closing here, what historical events will take place during the celebration of Hanukkah in the future? Only time will tell. Only time will tell. So we're in the spirit of Hanukkah, the celebrating Hanukkah and having a good time. And, Donuts, uh, latkes. Yes, eat things that are fried. But uh, So Hanukkah means dedication, Ryan. It sure does. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we dedicated to? That's right. It's the question. What are we dedicated to? Yeah. And that's all I have. Yeah, if somebody were to just send me their bank statement, I could tell you what you're dedicated to. Oh. I know, it's rough, right? Yeah, mine's food. Yeah. <laughs> Starbucks family you know, you coffee want, you want to pray us out father we love you and we thank you we thank you for the opportunity uh, to celebrate with your people uh, a season like Hanukkah where we celebrate the dedication of the temple the rededication of the temple and the future temple that is coming God 
And we are looking forward to your manifest presence here on earth. We're looking forward to the return of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach. And we just ask, Lord, that you would not tarry, but that you would come quickly. And we pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Uh, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are in the comments down below here, uh, whether it's on Facebook or or YouTube, or even if you want to leave a review of the podcast on any of the podcast apps, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. You can also email me at ryan at twopraise.net. Don't forget to subscribe, like, do all that good stuff. And uh, that's it. Bless you guys. Have a great week. That's right.